Good afternoon, welcome to this, the second 7 minute mini lecture on the structure and function of haemoglobin. As usual, you can discuss this lecture using Twitter and Facebook and access this and other content on Blackboard and our YouTube channel. Today's lecture is going to build on what we covered last time. We calculated that oxygen dissolved in the blood supplies less than 10% of resting demand. To meet the deficit, we introduced haemoglobin, a tetrameric protein consisting of four monomers, each with a protein chain and a functional group called heme, which is capable of binding one molecule of oxygen. We discussed how when heme binds oxygen, its shape changes by a tiny, tiny 40 picometers. Although this change is small in magnitude, the knock-on effects have enormous implications for how we transport oxygen. Looking forwards, we're going to discuss the three-dimensional structure of haemoglobin in more detail. We'll discuss how this shape changes when oxygen and a compound called 2,3-DPG bind. And we'll describe the relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the loading and unloading of haemoglobin. We'll also talk about what happens when this relationship is exposed to different physiological environments. So here's haemoglobin again in its structural form. But this is too complicated for what we're doing today, so we're going to simplify it to this functional diagram. We can still see the two alpha chains, the beta chains, and the encapsulated heme groups. Deoxyhemoglobin is in the tense state, with a very low affinity for oxygen. When the first oxygen molecule does bind, it triggers a conformational change in the structure of heme that has a domino effect through the rest of the molecule. The quaternary structure then changes, which increases the affinity for a second oxygen molecule to bind. Moreover, when this or second oxygen binds, the structure changes again, creating a greater affinity for a third oxygen to bind. At 75% saturation, haemoglobin has a great affinity for the fourth oxygen molecule, about 300 times greater than for the first. The quaternary structure of oxyhemoglobin is much different to that of deoxyhemoglobin. Not only does oxygen binding affect the oxygen binding sites, but also the centre of the molecule. This then becomes a binding site for 2,3-DPG, which is a glycolytic byproduct that binds to the beta subunits and pushes haemoglobin into the tense state, which promotes oxygen unloading. Proteins that modify their shape depending on what is bound or unbound can be referred to as allosteric. A really simple way to think of this concept is to consider haemoglobin as a party and oxygen molecules as groups of friends. With no one at the party, there's very little incentive or a low affinity for the first person to attend, but eventually someone will. As the party gets busier, all of a sudden it's the place to be and people are coming from far and wide. The party fills up fast. This phenomenon is called cooperativity. So, how does the partial pressure of oxygen relate to the haemoglobin saturation? Let's first add the normal physiological range for pulmonary and systemic capillary beds. We saw last time that the volume of oxygen in solution is directly proportional to PO2, a simple linear relationship. So hypothetically, if haemoglobin had a simple linear relationship, there would be a huge variation in arterial saturation and very little scope to increase oxygen delivery during exercise. Fortunately for us, this is not a linear relationship. In reality, haemoglobin can be effectively fully saturated across the whole normal range for the lungs. Also, there is a steep relationship between small changes in tissue PO2 and haemoglobin unloading. Onto this, we can overlay icons representing 100, 75, 50 and 25% saturation values on the y-axis and replace the two linear trends with the true sigmoid shaped relationship. The oxygen dissociation curve is sensitive to small changes in the physiological environment. It can be displaced to the right in response to elevated core temperature, a decrease in pH, elevated blood CO2 concentration, and increased 2,3-DPG. This rightward shift promotes oxygen loading, and perhaps unsurprisingly, each of these factors is associated with exercise. The curve can also be shifted to the left in converse circumstances such as hypothermia, alkalosis, hypocapnia, and low 2,3-DPG. The curve can also be stretched upwards in the presence of polycythemia and downwards in anemic patients. It's worth noting that in these circumstances, pulse oximetry could still be in the normal range of 95 to 100%, even if the hematocrit or packed cell volume was dangerously low or high. This could be differentiated by doing a full blood count 
check hemoglobin concentration. Finally, in carbon monoxide poisoning, there's a downwards and leftwards shift. This is because hemoglobin has a much greater affinity for carbon monoxide, about 200 times, and when it binds carbon monoxide, it pushes hemoglobin into the tense state, making it much harder to reversibly bind oxygen. So, although negligible by volume, the role of dissolved oxygen in oxygen transport should not be underestimated. Small changes can have profound effects on hemoglobin saturation and oxygen loading and unloading. Hemoglobin displays allosteric and cooperative behaviour. These characteristics make it ideal for loading with oxygen in oxygen-rich environments like the lungs and for unloading in low oxygen environments like respiring tissues. The oxygen dissociation curve is sigmoid shaped and sensitive to changes in temperature and pH and to changes in the concentration of CO2, 2,3-DPG and carbon monoxide in the blood. Next time, we'll discuss hemoglobinopathies and how they affect oxygen transport and we'll find out how a single electron can give this gentleman quite a cyanotic complexion. Thank you very much.